Chinese, uh, aka NSFDN. So uh, I'm Hop, I'm hosting the workshop. Uh, if you have any question or want help, please let me know. So today we have four keynote speakers to give four talk, and for each, we have uh, 20 minutes for the talk and uh, 10 minutes for the QA. Right? So uh, mm -hmm. uh, first, welcome Professor Lee and Sophie. Very good afternoon to all of you for coming uh, to today's session. So uh, we're really, really pleased uh, to host a local satellite event of Wisdom. As you know, Wisdom is going on downtown and uh, many of our students are actually down there. Uh, but we thought we'd bring the conference to you by asking some of our esteemed colleagues and peers in the IR uh, search and data mining community to join us locally here in the US. And we felt them a uh, joyous return home to their alma mater after COVID-19. And for some of them, it's their first visit to NUS. So oftentimes we have exchanges where you know people come to NUS or Singapore for our conference. They like to stop by in NUS. And when we can gather enough critical mass like this, it's uh, a great opportunity for all of you as uh, PhDs, postdocs, and undergraduate students either here physically or online to interact with our guests. So I hope you get a chance to, uh, to talk with them during the tea break, um, enjoy the interaction, and talk to you. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to Okay. So I also, I also want to give a quick shout out, shout out uh, to our uh, organizers, to our organizers they put together at the very last very minute. Last minute. Um, um, so they are, uh, they are really worried that their work wasn't good enough. Good enough. So, I want, so I want you guys, want you guys to test them with how loud you cheer for them. Have a hand for our staff, our staff, and our staff. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you for organizing all of this session. And without further ado, I think we'll let uh, Hal and Wenjia uh, introduce our first speaker for today. So, uh, okay. now we have uh, our first uh, speaker, Professor Grace Graham. And uh, Professor Grace is the uh, associate professor leading the Ingerson uh, group at Georgetown University. Uh, her current research covers uh, reinforcement learning, uh, interactive by agent and human filter AI. For years, she has uh, served on editorial boards for uh, and organized many conferences in the data mining permission table. Also, she is a recipient of a career award. Today, she brings to us the topic of uh, I call it a recitation, have to already answer Now, so let's work on uh, Professor Grace. This is my name. All right, so uh, I'm Grace, it's the only to come back. I graduated from uh, NYS and I to be a master's student uh, from a uh, uh, group. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is uh, about two years ago that I work, uh, like I work kind of uh, uh, using deep reinforced learning for uh, Conversation agent. Uh, I, I kind of work on like reinforcing many of projects uh, since I think like, 10 years uh, now. And uh, before I was there, I worked on like kind of trying to make search engines for them and even the interaction. I'm uh, kind of working to um, start to come to feel um, very. And so now, like, conversation agents really become uh, uh, a lot of people's interest. So uh, let me show this wall, this piece of this, uh, you know. Uh, the one mile, the one mile of the research. Now, of course, this is drawing work from our business students and Georgetown. Um, 
Yeah, so basically, uh, conversational agent. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I like to be a very, very uh, direct. Uh, so without a size, uh, usually without a size, I think I can I just talk for an hour, I have no problem. But I'll keep that my name down. And if you have questions, I think you're encouraged, I encourage you to have questions uh, to keep me on. <laughs> So there's many kind of uh, analog systems or conversational agents, you know, that's how they name it. But uh, from my view, they actually can be classified into this uh, open-ended, right? Or radio chatbot and uh, or call it task oriented. Mathematically, these two types, well, at the first time, they are more like you care about the accumulated thing. So in terms of evaluation, it's many people can take that thought is actually satisfying the user on the time. So the, the task is not convergent. But another type of task oriented uh, system, which will be the effect of convergent. So, for example, I will close the deal. That you know, I'm going to the negotiation. So there's something like that. And for this type of tasks or analog systems, um, their, their objective will more like, you know, like satisfying this goal. So, uh, I, 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 or like minimizing or maximizing the reward, something like that. So it's actually quite different from the very beginning, I think. I need to distinguish these two types of that. And, um, so today we'll talk about you know tax oriented. The tax oriented systems, well, you can uh, train them using real user. Okay, you can train them, uh, uh, and, and you can imagine that's really possible. Okay, so so this is our work that like, we are actually making use of uh, market work. Like the one of my, one of my early piece of work called uh, track, uh, you know, track. Uh, a tax retrieval conference, and we run the dynamic search of oh, no, dynamic domain track from 15 to 2017. And so this will build a simulator of this interactive search. And multiple words is also a kind of that thing. So in that kind of simulated dialogue uh, systems, and it's not a system being simulated, it's a user simulated. Uh, so basically, the user will know all the answers. No all answers. That's like your agent is the agent that actually plays in the game that's already been designed and uh, which is trying to simulate how a real user will respond. And so you you, you can you may see that the you know potential problem of this kind of simulator thing is um a lot of systems will be how can you make sure the simulator is perfect or is naturally not. To you know, teach the agents something reasonable. Okay. But we're not, we can, we can have that, you know, that would be another sort of discussion. But today, we, you know, this one, it's not, we're using a Wallis established uh, simulator, which is multi words. And just based on that, uh, let's see how to uh, learn a better constitutional agent from it. Uh, so I think one of these is when the user simulators they are uh, built, they are actually rule based, and there's a lot of domain uh, expertise being uh, put into it. Yeah. Um, so this graph actually shows like somehow like uh, uh, you know this uh, overview of this simulator, and you have your agent is trying to learn this simulator. And the agent also can have access to some kind of data base uh, or knowledge base, you know, to ground some of this, uh, you know, uh, facts, I think. Um, so because the simulator itself is actually built uh, mostly by experts, by human, by rules, but they're quite fragile. Yeah, they're actually quite fragile. And it's very easy to uh, break, you know. So, 
with the scale and simulator, and how can we still learn a reasonably or well um, agent? Okay. How can we still? Uh, so, like one thing is um, within the learning army itself, you know, we can introduce some kind of diversity. And in terms of learning agents, a dialogue agent, which is more diversified, what do you mean more diversified? It means it will be generalized and it be flexible, right? Not just the things that you tell them directly say, they can you know, uh, make some uh, you know, uh, changes you know, adapted to uh, some unseen situations. So there's some, I uh, yes, actually I think like the most very important thing is how you can install very well in the NLP uh, community. For example, enforce diversity directly in the objective functions. And so not only accuracy, you know, but also you need to really do you this knowledge of differences in your answer. Or you can preserve those uh, language rules, you know, when the agents are generating uh, the language. So if you play with Chinese, you you will realize you definitely are doing that. Or because conversation is actually a sequence of events, right? So if you keep think about the sequence, that is a trajectory, a trajectory of how I'm going to, you know, uh, how I'm going to do this. Uh, different milestones or hops, you know, and reasoning steps in this whole conversation. But we can actually randomize, we can randomize this uh, trajectory uh, synthesis method. Or uh, actually, one of this early work, I work with uh, uh, the team at uh, UC Berkeley, and we kind of uh, introduce these data sources and learn from elements to uh, basically um, learn from more diverse um, data cultivators. Right? Even though they're building a single user simulator, but who contributes this uh, data? A really human, who is the label that contributes into the data set? You know, you can purposely selecting some more diverse uh, choices. Or in a machine learning, uh, uh, in the second learning, first learning community, it will actually uh, it will sample some training trajectories to uh, from a diverse site of a learned environment or simulated environment. So, so this paper is actually along the last, you know, the last few. So the idea is, for example, Martin was so uh, I. I think you probably for some of the topics of the paper. <laughs> so you have this user simulator and it's given, right? Like a, a data set. And from that, right, we can add some randomness into it. So that's the, like the second group of thing I call is the diversified simulators. From the original one, we can, you know, uh, we can diversify that and how. For example, uh, we can learn a neural network to represent this, you know, interactions, this environmental model uh, of multi -world. So it's not exactly multi -world, but it's a neural network representing multi -world. And then we randomize the parameters of this neural network. So each of them, they will become like a, still very similar to uh, multi -world's a user simulator, but uh, will be slightly different. It's like, you have more brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And this agent now will have a group of brothers and sisters of user simulators. So we hope that this agent will learn a more diversified uh, behavior. You may ask why you bother to do things so indirectly. Why not use you know a diversified uh, not more tools? Okay. Being too subtle is because actually we want to offer. And I think one way is that if you inject into um, too many like human intervention, like just not what I described, um, all those human uh, intervention or the rules that you want to impose on the system, they will actually become very fragile. So it's better that we operate the whole system and therefore you see it's 
from the super miniature and then you'll learn your network and then you learn the work the primary graph in your network and then you'll learn from this tool. A uh, one issue I did that, you know, uh, because we're uh, adding noises, we 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 see we're creating more diversities, and we're actually adding more noises originally. Right. So as long as we're adding some noises into your uh, digital data sets, and already you know uh, prepared, of course you will have errors. Yeah, and if your agent is actually learning from them. Yes, it's uh, uh, very hard to say that uh, the error will not well, get actually very easy. You know, maybe the first step, or you say, okay, and now I have a more diversified, but the second step, you know, I see the horrible, you know, that our agent is just talking bad things or rubbish, you know. So this error propagation, you know, whenever you are you know, introduced to some random diversity, then the next step you have to handle that. So this paper is actually trying to you know, strike a balance, you know, how to, to do diversify but kind of control the error within some, uh, uh, you know, within, within a certain range. And I think uh, I can be really, really quick to introduce the idea. So basically, okay, uh, Yes, we have the original simulator and we have the diversi diversified ones. So the idea is you will not always rely on the diversified one. And from time to time, you will check the original ones because the original one is actually good for human. Okay. I think you like humans have precision on their job. Yeah. So the idea is here. Yeah. From this base trajectory, which is, you know, that will be a uh, very honest uh, interaction of this agent to uh, multi words. So that's something we call the uh, base trajectory. But at some point, you know, we want to, uh, we want our agent to not learn from this base simulator, but learning from a diversity, or learning from a brother, learning from a sister. But you only learn from your brother or sister, let's say, four or five steps of this learning episode. Okay, not forever, or three, you know, kind of, you know, hyper uh, parameter, you control that, and you do not always do that, right? It's only from time to time. So that's something we call it intermittent, and it needs to be short extension, right? So basically, you do a little bit, right? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess uh, that's the idea. And I want to report that uh, it works actually uh, uh, pretty well. Yeah, it actually works pretty well. And then there's all the maps to uh, basically uh, implement the hypothesis of the Yeah. And uh, so that's, you know, one of these operations we propose to control the quality of the diversification. Uh, to, to see this is we're actually trying to uh, control the quality of diversification while we're still doing diversification instead of it's already making mistakes and we're correcting the mistakes. So it kind of you know, prevents a uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the algorithm itself, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a uh, model-based uh, learning, like the first learning algorithm, uh, and based on a uh, hacker quiz and probably uh, uh, GTO. Yeah, but with this learning trajectory, it's been, uh, like I described, so first you diversify, and then the diversification is actually being, uh, Controlled. Yeah, so the, uh, uh, we tested on multi works and also reporting their senior evaluation metrics. And uh, yeah, I think we, we, we compare with a group of yeah, uh, pretty cool uh, based on DPO uh, and DQN, double DQN. Yeah, 
and uh, DCPL. So those are, those are, they are they are actually I think like uh, one year ago they were like sort of top performing uh, dialogue agents, yeah, top performing dialogue agents, like those methods. Um, and this is for the market works something like that. Yeah. And I think they still perform really well. If you know that, uh, like ChatGPT, the backbone is like this. So, but the difference, so first of all, ChatGPT is not trained only from a simulator. So this is, you know, this, you know, simulator. Well, the beauty is that if you can simulate it, you don't have to do any learning for them. You know, I think uh, that's the tedious job. But mathematically or algorithm wise, uh, I think it just shared a lot of common things. All right. So the results are actually uh, very well, I can say. Yeah, very well. So, so basically, they would, would run very well. It means the agent is flexible. It's not like giving you some of the answers. I think a student did some kind of analysis, like the diversity of, so, so like this axis, it x axis is diversity of how different each of his brother, you know, a sibling, a sibling as they are, their distance to each other. And this is the, uh, uh, sorry. Okay, I mean, here, here is their difference here, here are divergence, and this is an, uh, and then the size. So this is the size, it kind of found kind of like indicator. Uh, and yeah, size means how many you can uh, include in this group. So this is like a paper, like I think at least uh, a year ago. Yeah, but it addressing some very, uh, I think it is still a very relevant uh, problems. Like for example, control the error. Right? So for uh, a, a chatbot, even as good as ChatGPT, you cannot avoid, like, um, you know, coming out with like irrelevant answers or fake answers. It's very hard to avoid that or error. And as human will perceive that as um, error, right? Um, so basically how to control the noise, right? how to control the noise. And why, why we are not saying that you need to avoid because had the noise, I think exactly deals with why this agent, you know, they're they are more human-like, they're, they're taught not like uh, uh, like the locking systems, you know, uh, and you, you call a bank, you know, we always have a, a, a chat box. <laughs> it's for years, it's not like only now we have a chat box. And now you see the chat box just become very, very um, flexible. Very, very flexible in terms of no matter what you ask them, you know, they can like, give you some answer. So this is like the two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Mm. Um, all right, actually, uh, I, I want to, uh, do, I, do I still have time? I think I still have time after. Uh, you know, I want to uh, show some of my recent, another slide. Yeah, and questions about I'm talking about. Um, um, um. Thank you so much. The gentleman knows a like uh, a pretty quick academic part uh, for a work, a piece of work that's before chapter. And I would like to share with you uh, the, uh, a recent talk I prepared for uh, my department's um, grad students. Yeah. So the part I'm going to say, uh, in the field of this, uh, and 
Let out the opt-in that I first saw. Um, so this is from uh, uh, I, I, yeah, this is uh, I think this is the uh, Kubrick's uh, 2001 uh, The Space Odyssey. Yeah, so basically that in that way, this is the computer to uh, you know, uh, designed for end some of the student life because, uh, uh, you know, yeah, because it, 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 the, the computer is saying that's for better use. That's for better use. And this is from Matrix. So this is um, some Hollywood's imagination, uh, 20, I mean, in 1999. Yeah, so human becomes um battery or CPUs after providing uh like electricity and data to the machine. Okay. And uh, I think we are a little bit like this now. Okay. So I think chat GPT, yes, it is chatbot, but to me um it's more like a quite critical uh, moment for us to really think about this human and AI process. Yeah, there's many rumors concerning things, you know, uh, reality. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess that's the one of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, the panel that uh, we want to uh, discuss. So probably no one is trying to do this, right? Um, it's transformer, it's pre-trained transformer, and it's uh, reinforced learning is being used, you know, the training, yeah, and so it learns from the environmental data, yeah, environmental data. Um, the, and for a reinforced learning agent, it doesn't matter if it's a chat bot or it's a self-driving car. The algorithm itself is the same. Yeah. So the algorithm, so okay, so this this world represents uh agent. So the big agent is want to know okay, what do I do next? And what's the next word I should say as a language model? Yeah, and it will do this action something, so it will definitely try. It will try, it will try and get. The experience and it's from some feedback from the user and will perfect its policy learning. And at the same time, it's trying to understand the model uh, of the environment. The environment, like it's, it was like the simulation I was talking about, just simulation I was talking about. So, in just on that paper, I was talking about so the, uh, the agent actually makes up efforts to do a better model learning. To go back to model instead of okay, this is the model you give it to me, but I'm also you know automatically make several copy of it entirely different so that to make myself how to learning more robust, more flexible. Okay, so this is I I would think this is a fully complete uh picture to describe uh what the investment agents are doing. Yeah. Okay, so. In the past 10 years, I'm very interested in what the It's uh, because it's really actually just human driven. Yeah. So, this is uh, uh, like I, I, I just took a picture from my daughter's biology textbook. So, this is the real textbook that they can send to the United States. They're saying that what are the major types of learning, and that they are talking about animal learning, actually. Right. So, the first type is um, habituation. It means the animal they actually get used to the environment. Like for example, the one of the examples they gave was you know when the birds they uh, after a while then they will realize the cars will be no harm to them and then they will not pay attention to them anymore. So you get used to it. And the second time that like classical conditioning, uh, and the the third type. Often conditioning. I would think the first all three types they are actually really kind of how the animal actually learning 
that by accepting reward and punishment, and there's no reward or punishment that I just get used to. That's not that's not something of important to me. And the last part we call insight learning. I would say that's more like surprise learning uh, to our agent. So basically, it's like surprise learning and reverse learning, right? It's a parallel that of AI and uh, animal, yeah. So uh, my own point of view on why it, it like, it's like uh, suddenly it works so well. I tried that one, like, tried to suddenly. But I think there's some reason at first, like large computing power, like power and resources are becoming, you know, uh, more available. Uh, and this recent years of rapid development of deep learning that really helps. And also I think because chat or NLP is actually low risk domain what I need to load because human actually you know uh we get used to other people lying to us okay if someone lying to us we're fine yes people are complaining about all the chat GPT you know are not accurate or whatever well think about actually we can tolerate a bad answer but there's something that you cannot tolerate that is a self driving car you cannot tolerate that making a mistake so those algorithms are actually always there Useful. But now I, I would think that's like the, the, the first very successful application, right? I think it's a low risk domain that I probably um, plays a role. Another thing I think why it works so well is that in recent years, you must know that the deep learning they have been done really well. So here is the transformer picture, a transformer picture, kind of building a really well developed complex. But this is great, it's like kind of someone will have uh, a good brain. But without the learning, you are super, super smart and student with very high IQ, if you still cannot do much. So Rainbow's learning really adds this learning ability along another dimension, which is the time dimension. So now they have both this 2D of good brain and then this 2D of learning. Keep learning, continue learning. Because it's one, one more dimension is being added into this model of learning. So it gives huge power of mom. Okay, I think I'm going to see all the things. Yeah. Yeah, just in case you're curious about, you know, uh, like uh, PPO uh, with really uh, check stuff at home how uh, it makes it work so well yeah so here so this picture you're probably very familiar with yeah so first part like scratch learning yeah you don't have to uh, learn from scratch like why not it's like surprise learning already been so well of course you know we'll learn from you know build a, a good inertial model to start with and then okay, the second part is more like yes it's more like what I said just now, you know, they're trying to get a better understanding about the environment, including the reward model. So this part involves someone go to tell the agent what this environment look like. So therefore they're actually must hire a lot of you know, humans to do that. Right? And then the last part is the reward. And you see, it's not something surprising. It's not a completely new honor. It is actually just yeah, it's been invented for a few years. But I would say it's more like a, um you look at each part, they're not surprising. But I I, I really think that's uh a quite amazing actually. Yeah. You look at algorithms, uh I think they're fine, they're, you know, it's 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 reasonable. But some colleagues in uh open AI, I think they really make things work. And I I, I do believe uh, that's um, really amazing intelligence and a lot of engineering are meaningful. And it does so well. Yeah, so this is like the answers that I give to my student who graduate level of science and engineering. For well, this question, ChatGPT does 
correct, and half of my class couldn't make it correct. Okay, and half of them. And this question, none of my students get it right. And chat GPT also get it wrong. But I think it receives partial credit. It will receive partial credit from you. Okay, so uh, I'm quite impressed because uh, I think if, if, if my student did answer uh, like this, I mean, um, I would be pretty happy. I would be pretty happy. I think, you know, uh, maybe, um, you know, potentially, you know, uh, after you know two months of study, and you know we can we can uh, improve on that. So it means kind of human level uh, ability. As in, let's not say what ability it is, but I think it's kind of human level. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, Right, I have these slides because uh, like the master students, especially they worry about uh, as the CS professionals, what they can do. You know, we, we do have a few layoffs and see how see how value. The thing is the tiny part of people could become big high presenters. And most people, I don't know, like you know, like the CS professional can we can become like AI trained like this. Okay. And then there's end users. Only watch. That's great. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, there's this. I think a piece of insight I want to share is so whose job? I know there's a lot of prediction, but this is really just from me. I think jobs that match both criteria, both following criteria. Yeah, it's risky. First is the jobs its own process. Have some rules of procedure a lot of it. And the second, the job's output is non critical or can bear high risk, you can tolerate high risk. And you can match both, then uh, the job will be important. So if you do all that, you're still fine. Okay, so basically, surprisingly, I think drivers are safe, like doctors are safe. I think we're safe. And we're safe that we're we are actually safe because I don't think we have rules. Maybe our you know our our outputs, like our paper, our paper are not dangerous to anyone, you know, but I don't think we have a fixed process to produce the search. So I think we're fine. But, but a lot of other other people, uh, I don't think so. So this is a piece of work I highly recommend if you have a question about how intelligent the bot of ChatGPT is. So this is actually another piece of work that uh, around 2019 over and over did. So that's like a game where then the bot have like, they form two teams. Oh, they are playing this hide and seek game. Okay. So after the box, they, they learn are interacting long enough. So like with the brain, they, they, you give them time to learn. The bot developing amazing, you know, strategies and non-human can think of, no human can think of. Yeah, I highly recommend you look at their YouTube, you know, and ChatGPT is developed by the same group of people. And I am pretty sure, you know, this type of, um, intelligence probably surpass human is possible. It's probably in some part, in some way. Okay. So, this is like the high end seat. Um, yeah, and then one uh, line of research I'm currently doing is uh, offline. Because I do think like that having human labor in, uh, that's just against the human nature, you know. So uh, offline uh, linguist then since we already have uh, a lot of these recorded uh, conversation, you know, data. All right, to uh, the future, I think there will be the this will be the good ending. That you know, the AI will actually help us to become a superhuman and become a true collaborator. And this will be the bad thing. 
and, and, and this anti talk. I thank you so much. Well, thank you for your conference, uh, Grace. So, does anybody have a question? Please raise your hand. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I have a pretty deep voice, so I can also. Okay. Thank you uh, for the talk. Um, as ChatGPT is right up the alley of research, I was wondering to what extent is uh, affect your research agenda? Like how, um, like, did, did you do like some interesting research and you saw the uh, popping up and now you change your direction? But what is. Uh... No, it doesn't uh, change my direction. Okay. Uh, because I think I'm, I'm, I'm always not happy with what we have currently as like, this chatbot. So my work is always actually, um, I would say that kind of align with the same direction with chat GPT. So actually I feel very proud of the OpenAI uh, colleagues. I know, uh, well, myself, I couldn't you know, uh, produce something so general, okay? Because the, the chat GPT can answer questions like for all the domains. I can probably only do one domain, uh, one data set, but the methods and the thinking, I think we're like along the same line. So even though that's not created by myself, I feel super, super proud of them. And I'm very happy uh, it was. Thanks. So it just gave me more uh, courage and uh, uh, to you know, just do the first thing. Okay. We got another two. Hi, hi, Mr. Briggs. Um, yeah. Thanks for a great talk again. Uh, so actually, I have a question about the chat GPT. So as you uh, mentioned in your first work of how to embrace uh, diversity and how to balance the trade-off between diversity and noise, so I was thinking, uh, is it possible to you know like use the chat GPT as a huge simulator and it must contain a uh, a various uh, wide a wide range of you know your user behaviors because you learn from not only simulators but also the uh, real humans. So uh, if if it can if we can use the chat GPT as a huge user simulator, so and how can we you know uh, block off the the noise as you uh, say in the first word? Okay, to answer this question, I think we have to think about this whole picture. Yes, there might be some like that data. Like of simulator and just be actually getting new users, right? But there's you know you don't know who those people are, you don't know their their backgrounds, right? And now you are this human here. So I think yes, there's machine and it's also human. And eventually it's the human data, you know, um, like interacting uh, with each other. ChatGPT is probably just uh, wall, but then you know it represents a lot of labelers. Data and probably some PD from uh, the engineers in, uh, in open AI as well. Uh, I don't I don't know if you can, you know, I, I think it's it's already a very complex, a very complex creature. You can't treat it as just one. So you have to think like multiple things. Uh, I, I don't know like how exactly answer a question, but I just you know need to know that. Um, it's probably you know, a lot of humans, you know, in groups. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, and I just have two maybe quick questions. Uh, the first question, have you ever considered using maybe like meta learning to do the first work? And the, uh, the big question is about the, uh, maybe in the future for you to try to be for maybe emotion analyze, uh, which maybe currently chat GPT cannot do, and uh, maybe Koei also use the chat GPT to do the multimedia understanding because the chat GPT is currently is only the simple model. Okay, so first, uh, meta learning, 
Yeah, of course, I try my hand learning, but I have to try, I, I'm not pulling, I try my hand learning to my students in some of my uh, classes. Uh, well, I have to say that we, we didn't have results say, you know, beyond the uh, self art. Yeah, uh, there's excellent work from like Stanford and uh, Berkeley, like the mammal model, you know, but it, mm, like I said, like, for Rainbow's work, there's actually a lot of engineering work. Okay, P even PPO, like not all my students can, you know, uh, produce the same result. You know, there's, because the model, there's, it's, it's, it's like I said, it adds another dimension of learning. And if you talk about meta learning, that adds the fourth dimension of learning. And we have so many dimensions, so there's a lot of these flying parts. You know, it, uh, it, it requires uh, engineers or a uh, researcher's God sense to do that, right? So, uh, you know, in my own experiments, uh, no. Uh, I, I think it's very challenging, and I, I think uh, ChatGPT uh, they did very well. So, like I said, there's some engineering uh, genius in their team, not only research, but engineering genius. And uh, I forgot your second question. Just one thing about this. Uh, maybe in the future, could we use the chat GPT to do the maybe emotion? Just as uh, you say, the way they have the human use emotion. Maybe it's the same same sentence, same word, but mm -hmm. uh, we use different uh, voice, different uh, ah. emotion as they express different uh, meanings, right? Of course. And, uh, another question is about the maybe uh, except the uh, emotion, we also need a uh, multimedia, maybe just like voice or uh, images, the videos. So, do you think it is really quickly we will have a multimedia as a GPT or maybe uh, it will require a long time? Okay, so this is now you want to add more modality, you know, other than just language, right? So, even though like the rainbow thing is very, very powerful and flexible, but the transform itself, transform looks complicated, but it's solving, it's actually predicting what is the next word, right? So it's like, give me this word, what is the next word? So now you're talking about, you will be given a lot of sensors, right? Like what I see, what I hear. Okay, so now I would recommend that, uh, I think it would just that uh, input space will be bigger, you know? I don't think fundamentally, and it probably need to redefine what do you mean? So it's probably not a language model, it will be something else, but it's probably still a conditional model. So uh, it's not too different mathematically, right? And if you're interested, I think you should be able to look at the self-driving car, one of these early example, because for them, there's they always have sensors. And uh, also like voice. Uh, so when people drive, you do hear things as well. So you, you not only just see, Thing, you hear people the little point, so other things. So it's actually uh, so some of these applications are the language model, but like robotics or other reinforced learning use cases, they're actually always a uh, multimedia model. Yeah, maybe you can uh, you know, learn from them. So uh, thank you again for the wonderful talk. Okay, uh, so now let me introduce 